Is there been any thought discussion? Is there any design around trying to preserve and then being able to prove what the voter did? So as we, in the past, we had paper systems. You had a physical, something physical where a person could say, this is what I want. So when we move to the digital environment, it's a little different. So are the requirements or is anyone considering or thinking how do we how if, if asked could we prove that this is what the voter did so the question i'll repeat it for the benefit of the cameras we don't have the microphone there is about really the scope of the audit and whether it's effective does it actually preserve and have a way to prove what the voter did well, it's not identifiable with the voter, but what um, most jurisdictions now require is there to be a voter verifiable, right now it's a paper trail, because we, we don't yet have the technology to have non-paper independent audit trails, um, but there is some um, work being done there. But, um, so when you, before you cast your ballot, you should be able to review on paper what the machine is tabulating for your vote to determine whether or not it's accurate, and then um, hit submit, and so there will be a, two separate records of your vote, the electronic record and then the paper record that you checked yourself and um, feel confident um, accurately reflected your um, vote. So then somebody can actually compare the machine records um, against the paper records. We'll never be able to check which one is attributed to you as they shouldn't be able to do um, anyways. Um, there have been some that suggest that they should be able to take home a receipt with that. Uh, with that um, record, and that's something that is unlikely to happen. That is something that um, it, it facilitates vote planning schemes to be able to use that to pay you off for voting a certain way. And so that's a, for different security reasons um, that's unlikely to happen. But we should be able to verify in, in most jurisdictions um, through a separate place in addition to on the screen with how your vote is being reported. Again, the problem is that they don't check those two against each other. They should have procedures in, in the best jurisdictions. They would conduct an audit and actually check those to make sure they do match up. Is that a requirement? <laughs> Depends on the jurisdiction. Again, it's state by state. Um, there, there were efforts in the past to require this um, federally, but now state by state. Um, and some states have that requirement. Um, not all do. And that, that, that's certainly room for improvement there. Just a very quick clarification. Canada has well in excess of 90% registration to do that, but our participation is woefully low. We're not taking a lot of federal elections, which is very straight over 60%. So, in your answer, you would have said registration, but for participation. So, Canada has 90% registration, 60% of the process is You get a, a, a mail from Elections Canada, so it's yeah. nice nice. So, I, I would imagine it's well over. So a lot of uh, countries actually you know, had, uh, in, in U.S. history, we've had vote manipulation, you know, Lyndon Johnson and so forth. But in, uh, as we move to the digital age, this is a real risk in a lot of countries, uh, you know, and the question is whether that can happen in the U.S. Could the U.S. hack the election so that the government in power preserves its power? Yeah, well, I mean, there are some safeguards against that. We do have, um, we, don't, we have a state-based um, election system, so, and it's not actually centralized at the federal level, it's centralized in each state, and there's actually, we actually have highly decentralized elections within the state, so I guess it's just... Election. I'm talking about... Right. So, right. so 
that does, um, you know, they've been very detailed, and we have put out also very detailed um, security recommendations with respect to voting machines. Um, uh, we also have security recommendations with respect to um, databases, and there, there are some common precautions that um, that everyone ought to take. They, they, voting machines should not have wireless components in them, so they should not be at all connected to the worldwide um, web in any way, and um, they, they typically are not anymore. I mean, I think that we've gotten rid of all of the wireless components. I might be mistaken with this. Um, but they should not be accessible. I mean, so right now, they, people physically take out the machine cards and actually put them in a tabulator um, separately, so they are, there's no um, interconnectivity. I, I think we should we should probably move on to another topic, but um, um, if you have follow-up questions, I'm sure uh, Wendy would be happy to entertain them, and her email is available through the Brennan Center's website, if I can offer your availability. Yeah, yes. okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Wendy. We're going to move on now to Rosella Martinez, who again is with the National Immigration Forum. Hi, thank you. Um, well, in the context, you know, it's funny, I was, a lot of the things that, that, that Wendy, a lot of those same kind of, I'll call them key words, uh, are equally present in uh, issues related to immigration and technology and social justice. It's, there's a lot of crossover, not just um, in the places where you might traditionally think. And as I was thinking about this, a couple of things um, came to my mind, which I think probably a lot of you already know. One is just the um, assumptions regarding technology's perfection. I feel like we especially get that a lot in the immigration context when people are looking at technology as the, what I like to, you know, the magic bullet. Or the magic bullet, we're going to solve our illegal immigration problems that we have as a country with technology because that technology is perfect, um, which I think probably we all know is, is, is not true. Um, also, to again, this over-reliance on data. So the kind of data that we're accessing for um, determining either who's, who's an immigrant, who's not an immigrant, what kind of immigration status do they have, or what kind of history do they have, um, how, do we want to give them a benefit based on the data that we've gotten from all of these different sources that live out there. And in terms of immigration, um, and people who you know are intending to come here or here already or leaving or coming back and forth, um, even if you're a, I would say there's a whole spectrum of kind of where technology lives, and I'm going to run through that quickly. But in terms of this kind of over reliance on data and databases, for purposes of immigration, um, that data lives in a lot of different places. It lives primarily in the Department of Homeland Security and all of those uh, agency components. It lives in the Department of State. Um, Social Security Administration, Internal Revenue Service, Department of Justice, um, state databases to some extent um, in certain cases, and then also to um, commercial databases. Um, but if you look at kind of a spectrum of technology and immigration, it starts even before you come to the United States. It starts overseas. So if you're in if you are intending to come here and you're either at a consulate or you're accessing a website as a tourist, which you now have to do if you're from a what they call a visa waiver country, so a country that where we don't allow you to have, get a visa to come here uh, because you're a low risk of overstaying. So, for example, a lot of the countries in the European Union, um, we don't we don't make them get visas, but we do make them get online and register online certain information so that we can cross-check it against databases before we allow them to enter. So things like that. So there's an overseas component. Um, then once you're here and you're actually trying to physically enter the United States, right, there's, and whether that's legally entering the United States or illegally entering the United States, um, we've got, you know, our land ports of entry, um, certainly much more technology build up in the last decade. Um, than we've seen ever before. And that includes not just technology to check who people are, but also to the kinds of technologies to check things like rail cargo screening, passenger vehicles, radiation levels of, of, of people or cargo coming in, also to biometric information, um, checking not just identification, but also actual fingerprints in some places, facial recognition software. And there's a lot of stuff out there. So land ports of entry, airports of entry, of course, I think everyone here is quite familiar with that experience. Um, and then also, too, specifically the technology buildup that we've seen at the border, um, especially in the last 10 years, and 
that is not just limited to those ports of entry, but then also to the things like unmanned aerial vehicle um, vehicles or um, other kinds of um, radars or um, infrared systems, um, especially in, in the desert. So then that's entering. And then once you're actually here, um, whether you're a tourist, whether you're somebody who's here temporarily with authorization, um, whether you're a permanent resident, so a green card holder, uh, even whether you're a naturalized citizen, there's a lot of different places where you're interacting with technology, um, again, primarily through Department of Homeland Security, um, but there's a lot of information that gets collected from all these kind of multiple places that can really severely impact your ability to receive um, an immigration benefit, so whether it's you know your green card, your status, your citizenship, um, and then also too. So there's a whole host of things that kind of occur while you're here. And I think one of the things that I've always found interesting is that when it comes to perceptions about technology and databases, especially in the immigration context, there's I feel largely misunderstandings about the fact that oh that only applies to immigrants. That's not that doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to be worried about that. Um, but I think more and more we're seeing the impacts, um, and I think one of the things I'll talk to you about, the, the E-Verify system, um, does have implications for every single person in the United States, um, regardless uh, of citizenship, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but then, so, while you're here, there's a host of issues, but then also, too, when you're exiting. Um, exiting technology, exiting the United States, and I think this is a place where we're going to see a much bigger uptick um, probably in the next few years on the Hill in the last few months. Um, how the U.S. Um, monitors individuals who are here, who are leaving the country, um, whether they're here with authorization or without authorization, has been a real hot topic. And we're seeing a lot more discussion around how are we not only monitoring and tracking individuals in the United States who are here um, as immigrants, but also, too, how are we collecting the data as they leave? And there's not really a very good system in place for doing that. And so there's been a lot of struggles over the last decade to try and get us to a place where we would have comprehensive exit technology, both at land borders, uh, airports. <coughs> this is uh, certainly a place where there's bound to be more movement um, in the next few years. 